A bit of housekeeping before we get started, John. Yes, we should do that, shouldn't we? We need to remind people, uh, if they want to send in an idea for the overall concept and theme of our competition, uh, they need to do that sooner rather than later. Like this week. Yeah, this week. Otherwise, we'll have to come up with a suggestion. We will do. That's fine. Yeah, we're happy to do that. In fact, I've got some ideas already, so if you don't want to, that's fine. It probably implies that they're not really that bothered. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're just like, well, come on, bring it on. But if you think about it, it would give you a little bit of an advantage in the competition, wouldn't it? That's true. You might have already written a story on that yeah. theme and you're like no the theme has to be treacle <laughs> it has to be treacle <laughs> and then you could send it in from like eight or nine different email addresses all just sending in treacle so you've got like a really high <laughs> chance of it being picked um yeah so there's that yeah. there's that we don't want to overload you here but we have got <laughs> to give people too much homework yeah. to do uh, but we also need them to write um some poetry uh, they may have already written poetry that involves water in some way, shape or form. But if you haven't, you might want to pen as a fresh one yeah. because that would also be nice. But we are doing a we're doing a big poetry bonanza episode for National Poetry Day, which is at the start of October. And we are incredibly keen to show our poet listeners a bit of love. Yeah. So if you are a poet or you know a poet or maybe you don't even consider yourself a poet but you like writing the maybe odd Maybe you just dabble. Maybe you dabble. Yeah, send us a water-themed poem. We'd love to hear you read it as well, so send us an audio file of you. Like a little voice memo thing. That'd be great. Performing it. We'd love to us. hear it in your own voice. That's always best, isn't it, from the, from the actual poet's mouth. I think so, yeah. You get all the little nuances and things in it. I think that's great. Exactly. You know exactly how it's supposed to be. So yeah, send in your themes and, and send in your poetry. Do we need them to do anything else? That's it for now, isn't it? That'll do. I think that's, that's enough, enough, isn't it, for it? now? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But um, the poetry thing, you need to be sending that in before September, okay? And all of that can go to failingwriterspodcast at gmail.com yeah. and then we can celebrate you. And we like to do that, don't we, Tom? We do. We do indeed. Yeah. Okay, admin taken care of. Tick. That's that ticked off. What's next? That's that. Uh, um, introductions next. Should we do that? Yeah, let's go straight into it. So this week we've got something a little bit different, I'd like to think. Yeah, it is a bit different. Uh, we've got two double header mm-hmm. guests, both who are completely head over heels in love with language, I think it's fair yep. to say. We have Paul Anthony Jones a.k.a. Haggard Hawks, which some of you may uh, be subscribed to his Twitter feed. Um, And we also have Jess Zafaris, who is also very much into her etymology and language. And they're both basically just very knowledgeable about word origin and all that kind of stuff. And that's something that Tommy and I quite enjoy. So we thought, well, let's get a whole little conversation going. And um, and invite a couple of people. We'll have a little panel show situation going on. And so that's what we did. I reckon a word from German we have our own. The second from Latin sec we merely follow. We start to sing the song. From a window European we'll have to stop and make a small apology. Why? From a Germanic root we do we try? From French Trier, you will agree. When we know we'll cause a blunder. Which the word for blind lies under. And we'll mess up all our etymology. Right, uh, so we are honoured to have two guests on the podcast today at the same time uh, to talk less about writing and more broadly about the building blocks of writing. Yeah, brilliant. Should we, should we get off then, John, and leave them to it? I mean, do we need yeah. to... Yeah, <laughs> let's just sit back <laughs> and listen. We have Jess Zafaris, TikToker and blogger at uselessetymology.com and author of Once Upon a Word, a word origin dictionary for kids. And we also have Mr. Haggard Hawks himself, Paul Anthony Jones, word blogger and tweeter and author of lots of books about words and language. And most recently, why is this a question? Everything about the origins and oddities of language you never thought to ask. So first of all, let's start at the beginning. Um, What was it that got you hooked on linguistics and etymology? Jess? Let's see. So um, I could give you the boring answer, which is that I did some coursework on the development of English across literature. Boring. Come Mm. on. What's the the exciting answer? (laughs) Right. No, there's there's a way more exciting answer. So 
and I, in high school, I had this French teacher, um, absolute tornado of a human. Her name was Nanette Quinn. Uh, we called her Madame Quinn. Utterly brilliant, endlessly passionate, unstoppably interesting. Um, she passed away some years ago, but she made such an impact in the community that there's still a 5K named after her that's still running in Memphis. Um, she taught me many unforgettable lessons, some in French, some in English. And one time we were reading aloud in French class from the book Le Petit Prince. Um, we had uh, done a reading the night before for homework and we came across a word um that that hadn't been on our vocab list and she asked us what it meant and none of us knew we hadn't looked it up like it, we just didn't do it and so she asked the whole class nobody could answer she like tortured us by asking everyone in the room to make sure none of us had looked it up and then she exploded in this epic tirade and she stormed back and forth at the front of the classroom <laughs> bellowing in french and english demanding incredulously how on earth we could do this reading and counter a word we didn't know and then not look it up we had french vocab books we had worksheets we had dictionaries we had google fucking translate did we just <laughs> skip over words whose definitions we didn't know when reading books in english too did we not look those up either how could you meet a word you didn't know and choose not to learn what it means and we got nothing so else it's done post-traumatic it stress basically basically <laughs> um, and like the the like heartwarming lesson here is like never stop being curious never let lessons yeah. go unlearned yeah. when you have the opportunity and resources to dig a little deeper wow paul beat that one. Oh, that's a really cool story mine's that i was just a massive nerd I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I must have been. I think I was about six or seven or eight, something like that. And my grandparents got me a dictionary for Christmas, and I just became obsessed with it. I sat and read it like cover to cover, like you would read like a novel or something. I just absolutely loved it. And if I came across a word in there that I didn't know, I used to write it down. And if I came across a word in a different book that wasn't in there, I used to write that down. So I kind of just started collecting them. But yeah, I was obsessed. It was a kid's dictionary, I should say. It had pictures in it. Yeah. I wasn't sort of reading the OED <laughs> yeah. when I was seven. Not yet, anyway. I left that until I was nine. But, um, but no, still- I, I was just, yeah, it was just something about it. I was just obsessed with it. Yeah. I mean, you say nerd, but somehow that doesn't seem to go far enough. <laughs> I, I told this story in an interview on the, on the radio a couple of weeks ago, and the lady who was interviewing me went, um, were your parents not worried? And yeah, I was like, you are so, we okay? <laughs> no, oh they were fine. They were just like, no, that's just Paul. That's what he's like. <laughs> it's just Paul. He's just reading the dictionary instead of making friends. As he does. It's fine. <laughs> His words are the friends. Exactly. Exactly. He doesn't need people. He doesn't need fresh air. He's yeah. fine. <laughs> <laughs> why, why do you think it is so interesting, though? Because it does, I mean, part of the reason we're doing this episode right now is because me and John both find it fascinating, the whole etymology and... and language thing why is it why is it so fascinating i always think there's two reasons with this the first is that it's universal so it's sort of like yeah everyone has language in some way and most mm. people can't remember not having it yeah, yeah so it feels like it's really really inherent it's inherent in every person it's inherent in every culture and for me the dictionary thing i, I think it was maybe like a kind of it seemed like everything you could possibly want to know was in there. It was sort of like an, this order out of chaos thing. You know, you didn't need to be a scientist to know what one of these scientific terms was because it was there explained for you in really simple terms. So I think it was maybe like this mixture of every, it, it's something everybody has. And from a dictionary point of view, everything you could possibly want to know is in there. I, th- I think it's maybe that. So people like finding out about something that is inherent in them. And the dictionary kind of has all the answers, mm. I guess. Yeah, I agree. I just, I would say etymology is the history of everything. Like you're, if you look mm. into the origin of a word, you're mm. looking into the origin of what it means and where it comes from and why people call it that and the the culture that shaped it. So um, as someone who can't commit to writing about a particular topic, I'm a journalist as well. Um, I uh, I enjoy etymology because I get to write about every topic. Yeah, yeah. I think that's right. They're, like, they're almost like little fossils, aren't they, words? Absolutely. Mm. Yes, I was, I was going to say, it's like, you know, when they do the ice core down in the Antarctic or whatever, where they dig right down and pull it out and it's like it shows a history of the climate or whatever. The layers, yeah. Mm. It's, it's like a linguistic version of that, isn't it, to some extent? Yeah, it's, it's, it's all... looking back into the past, yeah. Yeah, and it is, and it is almost kind of, it taps into the... Um, the human need for patterns and puzzle solving mm. and discovery, doesn't it, as well? Yeah. Uh, fossil words are also a thing, which is kind of cool. Um, they're like uh, the word ado in Much Ado About Nothing or Without Further Ado, we don't really use it outside of those terms. Therefore, it's fossilized in those phrases. Um, mm. And that one's neat, too, because it's it's secretly an infinitive um, in 
old Norse inspired English phrases, often at was the the base word of infinitive phrases. Like normally infinitive phrases are like to walk or to go. But if we had had a little bit of more old Norse influence in English, we might have said at walk or at go. Um, and that's what a do is doing. It is like at do. So literally it means mm. the same oh, thing right. as like a big to do. Nice. Now, Jess, can I just say, I find that fascinating. That is really, really interesting. So take this next question in the spirit that it's meant. <laughs> do people get annoyed? I assume you do this at every opportunity when something <laughs> crops up. Do people generally, are people really interested? Do they get annoyed? Or is it even to the point where if something like that happens, everyone just turns and stares at you expecting you to know the ins and out of everything? <laughs> I, I think uh, later in life, as, I, as I've gotten older, the, the third is true, but I never bothered to stop to find out whether they were annoyed or not. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> of no concern, I have to tell you this. <laughs> It's important. <laughs> yeah. This is going to sound like a ridiculous question, uh, but this, this to Paul, how much of the dictionary do you reckon you actually know by heart? Oh, because we've got a test right now. <laughs> oh, no. Well, if I, yeah, like if I was to find an obscure word in the dictionary right now, what do you think the probability is that you oh, know what it means? That's a good question. So th uh, there's two sides to this. The first is that there are a lot of words that you can kind of decode. If you can split yeah. them up mm -hmm. into their right right units, that you know you can kind of usually have a bit of a stab in the dark. Yeah. There are an awful lot that you can't <laughs> do that with. <laughs> so if you yeah. were to pick one of those, you know, no, it's not going to happen. Um, I I did an interview on Radio Four a few years ago, and before we went on, they were like, "Is there anything you don't want to be asked about?" And I was like, "No, I talk about anything. Just don't throw a random word at me because that chances are <laughs> I won't know." And literally 10 minutes in, they went, oh, we've had a message in. Someone's asking where the word uh, kiosk comes from. And I was like, I don't know. This is live on Radio 4 <laughs> on Saturday morning. Oh, I don't know. So I kind of blagged it and I went, yeah, I was like, I think it might be Turkish, but I'll tell you what is Turkish magazine. And I went on a completely different story. Oh, that's nice. That's so, a yeah, great sidestep. So then deftly, deftly avoided it. <laughs> but yeah, that, like there are some that you can decode. 50,000 tweets in. I've probably covered quite a lot of other ones at some points. But uh, mm. yeah, there's still an awful lot that you just will not know until you kind of read it yourself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is yeah. what keeps it interesting, I guess, which is what yeah. keeps the passion burning. That You know, there's, there's mm. no way, is there, of knowing it all? No, no, you're just constantly discovering stuff. Yeah, yeah. There are words as well, obviously, that have an unknown origin. That must be really frustrating. Yeah. Are there any words that you've come across yourself that you've thought, I'm sure there must be something about this and gone on to find a, an answer or something that you think might be likely. That's a good question. This comes back to actually weirdly what you were just saying there, Jess, about uh, jumping in with etymological facts when you kind of least, <laughs> least wanted <laughs> by the conversation group. There, one of my best mates put on Twitter a while ago when we were sat watching the Olympics. We were in the pub. Shock. <laughs> and um, I, I just happened to say, isn't it interesting that Skull in relation to rowing, is spelled with a C, not a K. And he thought this was the most boring thing ever. So he tweeted, <laughs> tweeted a photograph of me sat <laughs> in the pub, looking very <laughs> pensive, watching the rowing. And of course, it went berserk on Twitter because Haggard Hawks got hold of it. So, um, and I thought, yeah, I'm going to write a blog about this. I'm going to find out why it's skull with a C. Mm. And it's one of these ones where whatever avenue you look down, it's just got question marks mm -hmm. yeah. all over it. There's just, there isn't enough, for whatever reason, there just isn't enough written evidence of it to kind of really fully get to the bottom of it. it you look it up and it just says it's the name of a type of ore. And you kind of go, well, yeah, I kind of, I kind of knew that. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Someone just made up the word. <laughs> yeah. Same with the word dog. Yeah, dog's a great example. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, really? You can't trace it back. What? Yeah, it's like greatest mystery in the English language. Mm. Yeah, there, there are a number of like, there are related words in other languages, but they come from the English word. And there's like, no, you stop eventually. Like, hund oh, is, wow. you know, because English was originally Germanic, um, hund is, was the older word for dog. And then dog appeared one day and they're like, no one knows where it came from. Wow. Sort of like a stray dog just wandered into the language, never yeah, left. Wow, that is cool. Mm -hmm. And you find it in like really early surnames and things as well. It's very strange. It's, it's yeah, it's very, very strange. I think Dogskin was a, a, a surname. Great surname. <laughs> yeah, someone who fronts a punk band. Yeah. It is, yeah, very <laughs> punk. Good punk name. I always think with surnames, it's interesting, obviously, that um, they come from the jobs that were people doing or the places that the person came from or whatever. 
Mm. And then there was there must have been a point, I don't know if you guys know when this was, there must have been a point in history where it just solidified and stopped changing. You know, that yeah. a, family, a family name became a family name. Yeah. And that was it. You were Coopers, even if you'd never been anywhere near a barrel. Whereas <laughs> there, must have, there was a point where that stopped. But why? You're correct. Uh, but this is one of those where I'm like, yes, I'm sure that happened at some point. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite facts in this vein is that uh, the ending S-T-E-R. See, she can't help herself. Can she? <laughs> can't help herself. <laughs> is that, uh, so the ending S-T-E-R that you see on like Roadster and Gamester and Teamster and, yeah. and Punster, uh-huh. things like that, used to be like a feminine agent noun ending. And it corresponded to women trade professionals. So in the same way that a Weber was someone who weaves, a Webster was a woman who weaves, a baker uh-huh. is a bit man who bakes, a Baxter is a woman who bakes. A Whoa, spinster is a woman who spins, you know? Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. That is good. I, I, Isn't it? That is. That's, um, I spotted that the other day with, I was looking up, because I do, I was <laughs> in the dictionary, <laughs> and I looked at the word upholsterer, uh-huh. and that comes from an upholder originally, but then that had this stir surname, uh, this uh, stir suffix attached to it. So you've kind of got like an upholster, mm-hmm. and then they added like an extra er under the end of it just to make it even more complicated. <laughs> and Paul never did get round to getting his chair fixed because he was too <laughs> exactly. busy diverted <laughs> off into the dictionary for eight yeah, hours. Exactly, <laughs> still thinking about Rowan. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Jess, tell us about Words from Hell, which is your new book. I think due out in November. Yes, that's correct. Uh, at least as far as I know, I think I need in order to get it out in November, I need to turn around this latest latest round of copy edits. So um, I can hear my editor screaming in the background. <laughs> <laughs> it looks absolutely a, a brilliant idea. I'm, I'm just going to read out a little bit of blurb on Amazon. It says. Dirty-minded word nerds and lewd linguistics lovers will derive unadulterated pleasure in leering at the origins of swear words, sexual lingo, inappropriate idioms, violent vocabulary, and terminology for bodily functions, not to mention the unexpectedly foul origins of words you thought were perfectly innocent. I mean, that's, that does sound right up our street. That was, that was in my original book pitch, and I'm, I'm quite proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. Yeah, tell us a bit about it. Yeah, so um, I I wrote a kid's book first. Up until like the moment that publishes, I am technically a children's book author. And then I plunge straight off of that particular waterfall into the depths of hell. All the kids reading the sequel. (laughs) (laughs) Need to like wrap it in paper or something. Um, Anyway, (laughs) so while I was writing the children's book, which was that was sort of um, the, the publisher that came to me with that idea already had the idea and was like would you like to write a kid's book and I was like I've never written for children um so I found while I was writing it that there were a lot of words that I couldn't include like they I just I cannot include the the history of the word fascinate in this book because it involves phalluses like that's I'm sorry oh, wow. um so that's, um, that is fascinating <laughs> isn't it in literal sense wow but yeah so I I so I started pulling that together and then also um a, another thing that comes up a lot um I have done a lot of like social and and editorial strategy. And one of the things that I do for publishers is I try to help encourage them to make their work accessible and equitable and make sure their language is, you know, if we're using intro that style guides include the proper um, identifiers for pronouns, make sure that Mm. images are optimized for people with uh, visual impairments. So there are chapters Mm. on bias, there are chapters on sexism, ableism. And I just found no matter like how, no matter what direction you look in, in English, there is, there is naughtiness, there is vileness, there is cruelty. (laughs) Um, There's also a lot of magic. And that's what I'm putting into the book that comes out after that in 2024. Mm -hmm. Was there anything you came across during your research that was like particularly uh, shocking or unsavory. Oh. Let's let's go dark. <sighs> really dark. Can we go like funny dark? Yes, please. That's <laughs> that's the ideal. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So. Um, probably two words that I did not know before I started writing this book. Um, I was looking up obscure words for like naughty things. Um, One of them is the word the phallic, um, which is a word for a type of meter used in ancient Greek poetry that's named after a huge model phallus carried around during festivals of Bacchus. Um, (laughs) But like it is a word for meter, but it means like a dick. (laughs) 
that's pointing straight <laughs> upward, um, which is kind of fun. Um, there's also, have you ever heard of the Classical Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue? No. It's fantastic. Please read it. Francis Gross. Please read. Okay. Yes, he knows. Oh, yeah. He knows. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's terrible. It's this ridiculously over-editorialized, nonsensical dictionary full of words that may or may not have existed outside of his particular, like, social circle because they're not recorded right. anywhere else. <laughs> um, and one of them is, uh, one of my favorites is Rentalian. And in the classical dictionary of the vulgar tongue, that one is described as being one whose scrotum is so relaxed as to be longer than his penis. <laughs> or one whose shot pouch is longer than the barrel of his piece. Um, it's also, it, it is recorded, and other similar words are recorded a little bit earlier, like um, the word rantipole is possibly related, which was like someone who was wild or rude, but also was found in the phrase to ride rantipole, which refers to the woman on top or cowgirl position. Wow. So, you know, <laughs> that book in general is just full of gems. Highly recommend. And when was that, when was that written? Um, there's a 1785 edition, but the one you most oh, right. easily find online is, uh, I, I think the, the most complete version is the 1811 one. Brilliant. Does anyone have a favorite swear word? I like them all. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm an equal opportunity curse. I speaker. think I am. Yeah. <laughs> there's one thing that I've noticed is that, um, I, I love saying fuck. It's great. And I say it far, far too often. But then like, as soon as you put me in a car, I get really creative and just <laughs> sort of like... I, I'm not an angry person at all, except when I'm, you know, stuck in traffic or something. And the versions of it that I'll come out with, I'm kind of like, wow, even I'm genuinely quite impressed by it. <laughs> it's how disgustingly <laughs> creative my brain's getting in this traffic jam or whatever. So yeah, I'm a big fan of fuck, but you know, any version of that thereof. In my next book, I have a, a, a passage on um, compound insults and you can play a game with it mm. where you make your own. And so like in one in one column, I have words like fart and douche and cunt and shit. Um, and uh, on the other side, I have like muffin and sack and goblin. So you can make like <laughs> butt waffle or <laughs> cum nugget. And like there's just so much fun you can, that can be had with swear words. It's weird how they all work as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I, I do like about swear words um, and, and frustrates me to no end is that there there is a desire among the entire Internet to make fuck and shit into acronyms. They're not. Yeah. Oh, like yeah. they're like Old English and Middle English words that just came out of our faces when we were mad and wanted to describe sex and shitting. Um, but like when you hear around fuck is that it means fornication under consent of the king when like none of those like the word is older <laughs> than half yeah. of those words in english and king wasn't even mm. spelled with a k then you know mm. but then you learn that those are called backronyms yes and you go, yes, and you go oh that's i want to meet the person who thought that and i want to shake their hands that's just <laughs> beautiful imagine having that thought being in the bath and going we should call those backronyms and realizing that you've had one of the greatest thoughts of all time just beautiful beautiful mm. But yeah, people want to do that with everything, don't they? Mm. Like um, Posh of Port Out Starboard oh, yes. Home. Yeah. Which, I mean, it's just like a need for people. To, I wonder if it's people enjoying the etymology sort of thing, but you know, not being willing to spend all their teenage years reading a dictionary and just kind of <laughs> wanting to shortcut to knowing. The annoying thing about that is that there are a lot of words that really are acronyms <laughs> as well, like <laughs> scuba and laser and yeah. taser and... Do you know what Taser stands for? Is that Thomas someone electric rifle? Thomas Swift's electric rifle. That's it's so it. fucking disturbing. Oh, wow. oh my god. <laughs> it's it's about it's based on this book. The like the, the the guy who created the Taser read this book about Tom A. Swift, which is created by the same set of ghostwriters who wrote like Bobsy Twins and Nancy Drew and things like that. Edward L. Stratemeyer. Um but he read this book called Tom Swift and His Electric Rifle or Daring Adventures in Elephant Land. And that is the most racist book I have ever read in my life. It is wow. obscene. And it also involves like wholesale elephant slaughter. So Taser has some wow. some disturbing history behind it. That, going back to that thing of everyone wanting to attach yeah. a kind of acronym to everything, that there, there is a kind of joke that because everyone tries to make words have like nautical origins as well. There's a joke right. that um, <laughs> canoe stands for the committee to ascribe a naval origin to everything, <laughs> <laughs> which is very, very popular. <laughs> I hadn't heard that one. I like that. I feel like we should do a song about acronyms, John. Oh, no. And put that in here. Yeah. 
It's got it's got a good. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in there, isn't it? You could use. There is, yeah. And then if we, as a big finish for the song, if we can come up an acronym for the word acronym, that mean, <laughs> that, mean that that's where that came from. I think we've got a, a top class ditty on our hands. Something like this. If you invent something and its name's all clunky, don't, don't let it phase you. Just whip out some letters and shorten it to Scuba, Radar or Laser There's NATO and FOMO and NASA for space There's JPEG and GIF and Spam for a taste And eight is one you wouldn't want to catch Unlike a movie at your local IMAX And there's lol laughing out loud Not lots of love As grandma thought when she texted you Upon the death of your dog Still she meant the best And you know what they say YOLO! Which is how the cool kids say Seize the day But what about those acronyms engineered in reverse? A backronym just seems to make everything worse. Look, golf isn't gentlemen only, ladies forbidden. I'm afraid that etymology is somewhat more hidden. News might be notable events, weather and sport. Tell me that's not what you actually thought. I say fuck. Fornication under consent of the king is a myth. And ship high in transit is just a boatload of shit. A tip is not to ensure promptness, though that it may. And posh was never port out starboard home anyway. There's ones that get doled up. That you will have seen Like pin number And ATM machine But one thing we're sure of That simply must be That makes so much sense It's easy to see An interesting fact That not many will know huh? That acronym it stands for Well, here we go Abbreviated contraction regarding overt noting your modification. Abridged concept replacement of new yonder meaning. Altered because reading often knocks you massively. Accepted classification rules of naming, yielding miniaturization. In fact, that last one is brilliant. Let's go with that. Big finish. Are you ready? Accepted classification rules of naming. Accepted classification, classification rules, rules of, of naming. Of naming. Paul, I read your book, Why Is This a Question? I absolutely loved it. It's so good. Yeah, it is very good. I thought I thought you pitched it just right as well, because it feels oh, like, good. You know, it feels robust and academic, but it's also completely not boring. <laughs> <laughs> good. Um, and I, I would massively recommend uh, anyone interested in language to go out and buy a copy. I think you should probably use that quote on everything. Completely not boring. <laughs> <laughs> you can use that um, yeah your book made me realize um how much we take for granted with language and i mm. uh, probably presumably because we we learn it at such a young age like we were saying before and it's part of your everyday life mm. you don't tend to think about why language is the way it is no it becomes invisible to us doesn't it it is yeah. completely so for, for example you look at how we um we capitalize our first person pronoun i mm. and no other european language does it no um we don't do it with any other pronouns but i'd never thought of that before <laughs> never even considered it <laughs> was was that kind of the starting point for the book was it things that people don't realize they don't know um i'd say what started off it was a few years ago i think it must have been about 20 20- 15, 2016, I wrote a blog on Haggard Hawks, which is about oh, yeah. the origin of 11. Mm. And a part of why I talked about that was to do with why 11 and 12 aren't teens. Because oh, yeah. we've got this decimal number system and everything fits in nice sets of 10 and everything goes back to sets of 10, but apart from 11 and 12. Mm. Um, and part of kind of what I had to address to kind of explain that was to explain that 
you've kind of got to unthink your number system, kind of unthink what, how, why you count the way that you count in order to understand mm. that etymology. And it went really well. Everyone seemed to really enjoy it. And it's still like one of the most popular blogs that's on there. Um, and that kind of gave me the idea to, you know, there's a probably a book in like answering questions you never thought to ask. Mm. So I kind of filed that away and I thought, right, okay, I need to build this up and come up with some ideas. So yeah, it's like, why do we capitalize I? Why is the alphabet in the order that it's in? Why do we put words mm. in the order that they go in? And wrote all these down and kind of curated it for six years or something. <laughs> and then um, finally kind of sums up the courage to write it. And then kind of retrospectively found out how horrendously, disgustingly hard it is to answer those questions, actually. Like, <laughs> there is a reason why no one knows why the alphabet's in the order that it's in, because it's really hard to explain it, and no one's really ever tried to do it before. So, yeah, I, I initially pitched it to my publisher and said that I'd write it in, I think, six months, and it took two and a half years, I think. <laughs> It's a slightly <laughs> off schedule, just ever so slightly. A tiny bit. But yeah, it was it was kind of approaching the entire subject from that point of view of like, kind of giving you like a sort of primer in linguistics, but from the perspective mm. of, the, like you say, it's the sort of stuff that we take for granted. Why, why do we yeah, do yeah. what we do in the way that we do it? Mm. When you were researching the book, was there anything that really surprised you? Because obviously you know a lot about language already, but w what were your little personal discoveries? The one that still really kind of sticks out is um, I, I w really, really wanted to write a chapter about what the hardest language to learn is. Oh, yeah. Because that comes up mm. quite often on language blogs and everyone comes to the wrong conclusion <laughs> and it really annoys <laughs> me. Um, the only thing that you can ever say about that is that it that is that the concept of difficulty changes depending on what language that you already know. Yeah, That's it. Yeah. You kind of, there, there isn't an answer to that. If you already speak Japanese, Japanese is not the hardest language <laughs> in the world to learn. <laughs> it's just kind of as simple yeah. as that. You haven't sort of won linguistics if you speak Japanese. So um, yeah, I, I kind of really wanted to approach that. And I, I knew kind of early on that the only conclusion that would kind of prove that would be to point out how weird English is Yes, yeah. in a book that's written in English. <laughs> and so I, I kind of needed that killer point to go, right, okay, what's, what do you really think is easy in English? But actually everybody else looks at English and goes, why the fuck are you doing mm. that? And the thing that we do is to organize questions in the way that we do. We, we have what it's called subject auxiliary inversion so we can take a normal sentence a declarative statement like i don't know you are going and we can make it into a question just by shuffling the words around so we can say are you mm. going so suddenly this declarative has become an interrogative a statement has become a question and to us that is the most natural thing in the world that is just mm. one of the three ways in english that we make a question but worldwide it's about so far it's only been found in about one percent of all the languages <laughs> in the world there's about seven and a half thousand languages um and i put this on twitter once and everyone had a go at me going this is obviously wrong because you can do it in french and because you can do it in german and you can do it in dutch and you kind of think well yeah that's like maybe 20 languages in, in western <laughs> europe there are like there are a lot more <laughs> languages than that um so yeah it's only it's only this kind of little pocket of languages in western europe that does the same thing and english happens mm. to be one of them to us the most normal thing in the world worldwide just not how other languages operate mm. so um in terms of sort of what makes a language unusual what makes a language strange and difficult from the outside looking in it, there's you know something that we completely take for granted that's really bizarre to everybody else yeah yeah that reminds me of um initial stress derivation which is when the emphasis changes syllables between parts of speech so like conduct yeah. versus conduct mm. and record mm. versus record permit versus permit mm. that's another one of those things that english is absolutely replete with <laughs> it's just like homophones and homonyms <laughs> yeah yeah one thing we don't have to deal with in, in English is um, genders and, and in gendered languages, mm. you, you have homonyms, but they have homogenes, which is mm -hmm. words that are, they look exactly the same, but the meaning changes depending on whether they're masculine or feminine or whatever the two mm. genders are. So I, I think I would use an example in the book of mari in French, which is a, a husband, but it can also mean marijuana depending on whether it's <laughs> masculine or feminine. So <laughs> yeah, you want to make sure you get that right. <laughs> mm. One of the languages that stood out in the book, Paul, was the language of Madagascar, the demonstrative pronouns of Malagasy. Oh, yeah. Tell us about that, because that mm. that's a lovely example of how mm. different languages can be. 
Yeah, it's it's really interesting because they have kind of in English we have sort of this and that and all the rest of it, but in Malagasy they have seven. I think it's seven layers of distance. Um, so if you're saying look at that, the word for that changes depending on how far away from you it is. So if it's right in front of you and you can see it, that is a different word from it being far away in the distance and you can see it, and that's a different word from being far away in the distance that you can't see it or there's a different word for in the middle distance but out of view <laughs> so there's this whole sort of system of uh of derived <laughs> kind of this that and the other kind of words really specific distance really really specific yeah based on how far away from you it is i can only think that things like the football commentary on madagascan radio <laughs> must be better. <laughs> you've got a really clear idea of where the ball is at any one time yeah but i guess stuff like that grows out of um what the society needed to get from the language yeah absolutely mm-hmm. yeah and that was obviously important to them to say that tiger's quite close <laughs> that tiger's yeah. quite far away <laughs> okay really close now yeah invent a new uh, word it's got me <laughs> i can't remember whether it's madagascar or not but i it's it may be um and there are several languages that this applies to but um many places with like very rich forestation have lots of different words for green and they're like shades of green that that mm. the english speakers would not be able to distinguish between <laughs> but then those same languages don't necessarily have a word for blue and consider it another shade of green mm. yeah and, mm. and apparently that does actually change your perception of mm-hmm. the world around you as well doesn't it and not having the language mm. to describe certain things it actually changes how you consume yeah that's fascinating isn't it yeah mm-hmm. it's it's like those languages that don't have numbers we kind of can't possibly envisage kind of how you go through life having no concept of counting anything mm. but if you don't necessarily trade with anybody else or you don't have a concept of currency or anything like that you, you don't need massive numbers of things I, there's that language i think it's matt says which has words meaning i think it means one object two objects and just sort of lots of oh, like the only concepts of numbers that they have uh because that's that's all that they need how, how did they order chinese takeaway <laughs> <laughs> do they have to like read out the actual dishes <laughs> one at a time obviously <laughs> wow that's crazy that's crazy <laughs> well done everyone you've got through quite a bit of this episode of the failing writers podcast amazing work Not too much left to go, I promise. You're doing great. Go on. You can do it. I believe in you. I've got a theory that I I want to test on you both while we're all sat around here. Uh Um, Uh Uh-oh. So you know Mm. know how there are people who get really apoplectic about misusing words or getting grammar wrong? Oh, yeah. I've got a theory that, Mm. like, proper linguists, ironically don't get nearly as upset by things like that because because they understand <laughs> that the nature of language is evolutionary. You know, that language has never been a fixed thing. Mm. Or have I got that totally wrong and you're both really finickety? <laughs> <laughs> Jess, how, what are you like with uh, things like that? People get grammar wrong. Are you kind of, uh, it's just, that's language changing in real time. So um, I have two two sides to this story because I'm, I'm an editor by trade. So sometimes it's my job to make sure that your writing fits the style guide. Yeah. That's one side of it. But you're correct. Language evolves and being pedantic about it is far less fun mm. than tracing the ways in which it changes. Um, it's missing out on so much wonder and self-expression and understa- understanding and utilizing traditionally good grammar can have benefits. People tend to take you more seriously yeah. in the workplace. People tend to perceive you mm. as being more intelligent. But the, the history of good grammar and those who decide it is also riddled with bias and centrism and mm. often beautifully rich hybrid languages and dialects are dismissed because people perceive them as being examples of bad grammar. Yeah, yeah that's a really good point. Yeah. Mm. Linguist uh, Gretchen McCullough's book, Because Internet is Wonderful, it dives into the history and logic, which there is logic and grammar mm. of internet speak. Mm. Um, my, my position on it in general is um, of like good grammar. It, it's sort of like art. Knowing the rules helps you break the rules but sometimes you need to just throw them out the window that's good that's good answer (laughs) what about you paul are you um are you a stickler uh linguists kind of have to be descriptive not prescriptive so we describe Mm -hmm. what people are doing we don't tell them what they should be doing okay i I remember one of the very first kind of things i was ever taught when i when i first started studying this is that there's no such thing as right and wrong in language there is a, a standard that's 
intentionally curated. And then there are things that are non-standard. That doesn't necessarily make them wrong. That just means that it's not the standard. Mm. So um, if you say, you know, me and you are going to the pub, that's wrong, quote unquote, because it should be you and I are going to the pub because me is an object pronoun and doesn't belong at the start of the sentence. But if you said that, people are still going to understand you. And (laughs) And probably think you're less of a dick as well. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. If you start saying you and I are going, you know, um, and I think a lot of the time people who do kind of get really uh, kind of worked up about this, it's exactly what you were just saying, Jess. There are a lot of people ascribe to grammar problems that are really just issues of style and issues mm. of register. Like you, you don't talk to your mates the same way that you would talk to a police officer or a bank manager mm. or a judge in a formal situation. Or write an article, yeah. Yeah, so um, it, it, it's that thing of, you know, people know what the rules are, but you don't need to follow them all the time. Mm. So I'm, I'm not kind of too interested in telling people what they should and shouldn't do. Mm. And and from a linguist perspective as well, it's, in, it's often, as you say, it's interesting to talk about why people do the non-standard things that they do. Uh, rather than kind of tell them what they should and shouldn't be doing. Mm. Mm. And it's fascinating, isn't it, how angry people can get about it and Mm. how a lot of the stuff is just from a handful of people who decided 200 years ago that that's what we should be doing, actually. Yeah. But yet it's so ingrained. I don't know if it's a a school education thing where it's kind of almost beaten into them, Mm. so therefore it becomes an absolute immovable thing. But it's... uh, Mm. It's just interesting. It's so recent in, in relative terms. Mm. I, I mean, I used to be a pedantic little shit, but that's because <laughs> I was a kid. And, and kids are. I thought that my power lay in my uh, ability to use words. And that's about it. Yeah. But that's a good point, Tom. Uh, was it Bishop Robert Loth? Uh, he had a lot to answer for in terms of grammar because a, a lot of the rules were formalized by him. Yeah. Right? There was a lot of sort of Victorian grammarians, I think, set mm. down a lot of rules. And, and a lot of those mm. rules were sort of misguided. They were based on trying to make English more like Latin. And yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not Latin. It's yeah. Germanic. It, it's completely mm. unrelated. So, yeah, it kind of doesn't make an awful lot of sense. The, the classic example is um, people really hate literally being used to mean figuratively. And now I think Merriam-Webster was the first dictionary to kind of break cover and admit that as a as a, one of the new definitions that you can actually do this. Mm. It's. I think it's still marked as non-standard or it's marked as informal or something. Mm. And there was this whole sort of editorialising about how this was the death knell of the English language because that's <laughs> not what this word means and it shouldn't be done. And it's like, it's just the job of the dictionary to record what people are doing. It's not the job of the dictionary to tell you what you should and shouldn't be doing. And if you look at like tall used to mean quick, that that is not what it means now. Nice used to mean ignorant. That's not what mm. it means now. These really basic words have completely changed. And mm. just because it's not happening in your lifetime, you kind of lose sight of the fact that they've changed. So yeah, literally doesn't literally mean that, but um, <laughs> in practice, it kind of does. And just because other people do it, it doesn't mean that you have to do it as well. Literally is also a bad example because the word itself is not super literal. Like if you want to out... <laughs> pedantic somebody on that one unless it's referring to actual letters on a page it's not actually literal <laughs> like <laughs> we've been using it fig- figuratively for its entire lifetime <laughs> i want paul to come back with something now i want it to be like that this i thought we just got into like a, a word rap battle then where he'd say it. <laughs> yeah. and, then just, and then he goes yeah but actually <laughs> i don't know if i've got anything i've got this i was watching a program the other day and someone uh was talking about how nice it is in the southwest of england and they said everyone should go to cornwall at some point in their life it'll literally blow your socks off <laughs> and I said, "Oh no!" <laughs> I thought, right, what happens when you cross the Devon border here? <laughs> it's like some sort of explosive going on. I don't know. But that's why you have to accept that language changes, Paul, and the meanings change. Exactly. It? You see, yeah. I've got to learn my own lessons. Yeah. Obviously, <laughs> stop taking everything so literally. <laughs> hey, how do you feel about being put on the spot? Because we thought it might be fun. Um, and admittedly, probably more fun for us than f- yeah. for you, to be fair. But uh, <laughs> we thought we might get you to flex your lexical pecs and see how you respond to some quick fire questions about um, etymology and language and stuff. Do you, are you up for that? Yeah, definitely. Always. Oh, lovely, lovely. Okay. Jess, mm-hmm. favorite word, what it means and its etymology. Go. 
changes every single day, but today I think it's cryptonym, which is another word for a code name, literally meaning hidden name. And uh, the crypto element shows up in other words like cryptogram, meaning hidden words, and even a crypt where you store your bodies. Brilliant. Uh, that same question to you, Paul. Favorite word? Where it comes from? Uh, transpontine. Ooh. It, it describes somewhere that's on the Ooh. opposite side of a bridge. I absolutely love that word. <laughs> I absolutely love Probably because I'm in Newcastle, but I absolutely love that. The etymology is really straightforward. It's just pontus in Latin, which is a bridge, and trans is obviously a movement across it. But, but what I like about this is that in the 19th century, theatre critics started using it to describe things on the south bank of the Thames. In a, de- in a derogatory see, way like, or in a... Yeah, it was like, whereas on the North Bank, you could go and see like <laughs> Shakespeare and Jacobean tragedies and things. On the South Bank, you could go and see like murder mysteries and comedians and tumblers and things. Oh, that's so transpontine. Yeah, so transpontine. <laughs> it kind of came to mean like playing to the gallery. It kind of mm. came to mean like exaggerated, which is nowhere near the etymology of that word. So you've got this great Beautiful. word that has this like little microcosm of language change in it. I love it. Beautiful. Jess. Do you have a common linguistic myth that you would like to right now debunk? Oh, this is this is going back to what we were talking about earlier. But the funniest one, I think, is the the notion that shit is an acronym. What's the acronym for that then? Uh, they think it's ship in high transit or ship high in transit. Another nautical word. <laughs> yeah, another one of those nautical <laughs> words. And it's the idea that like manure was documented in a box high on a ship so that it doesn't explode, which is that's nonsense. It's utter nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. And Paul, can you think of a uh, some kind of linguistic idea that's generally accepted but is total balls? You know, I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to say that there's something that people say you shouldn't accept that you should, which is singular they. There is absolutely nothing mm-hmm. wrong with it. It's just, it's nonsense. People hate it for absolutely no reason. The only reason people think singular they is, not, is wrong because they're not taught that it's right when they're at school. <laughs> it's, it's mm-hmm. yeah, the singular they. I'm constantly advocating that. That's good. People are always trying to get me to use um, my knowledge of Old and Middle English to defend uh, one way or the other. And I'm like, you you should not apply Mm. this to modern pronouns because uh, Old English had like (laughs) 17 of them. (laughs) (laughs) And like, it was gendered, so a desk had a pronoun, you know, like, other than it. Uh, Okay, Paul, you go first this time. Something that very few people know about the English language. That's a good one. You know, it, it might be that we have two TH sounds and we completely take it for granted. Mm. We have we have what well, they're called dental fricatives, which is that th sound. And we have two of them. And it's not many languages do. So we can tell the difference between thy, like the old fashioned pronoun, and thigh, the part of your leg. Mm. And if you a lot of languages just haven't got the ear for that at all. So to, to a lot of people, those two words sound exactly the same. Yeah. But yeah, English is very strange in that we have two different THs. And that's another fascinating thing. I remember learning about that in my English degree, about the inability to make sounds after a certain age once you've learnt a language. Mm. Um, so you, you'll get people from sort of the India area that can't say V. Hmm. And, and it's, mm. it comes out as a W. But... It, there's a there's a period of time while you're learning language that you have all these sounds at your disposal, but your brain mm. siphons them out yeah. depending on what language you learn. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. And so, Jess, do you have a, a rare and fascinating fact about the English language? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, the the one that I always like that I, I think people find the most interesting is when a word is surprisingly recent, like. Um, the word escalate mm. didn't exist until after the escalator. And so if you see like historical fiction where they're talking about like escalating tensions, that wasn't a thing that anyone ever said before <laughs> the 1920s. Um, and it, it was, it's a back formation from the word escalator. Wow. Um, wow, though the word, good. the word escalate did exist. And that meant literally to climb with a ladder it appears in the context of uh, sieges. The other one is hello, um, was not a common standard greeting before the invention of the Bell Telephone. And it was Thomas Edison who recommended that, or who had landed on using hello. And it's like we had hello and hello, and they were all like distance shouts that you might say from across mm. the fields to your border collie or something. But we didn't have like hello as a standard greeting. And uh, Alexander Graham Bell wanted to use ahoy as that greeting instead. Yeah, nautical <laughs> again. Uh, yeah. God, the world is obsessed with ships. <laughs> I like to think the Madagascans are listening to this going, just just two or three words for hello from different distances. <laughs> come on, come on yeah. people. <laughs> uh, Paul, give us an example 
of something about the English language that we take for granted that is actually really weird when you think about it? Um, I think probably the alphabet, going back to talking about that, mm. that we think it's fixed and it absolutely isn't. Like if you buy a, a school textbook from even like 100 years ago, it had an ampersand at the end of it, it had 27 letters. <laughs> and the first time the alphabet was written down, I think there was 29 letters and some of them have gone and some of them have shifted around. And I've got a dictionary here that has I and J words all kind of lumped in together. So yeah, but nothing is ever fixed in language, not even your alphabet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's not true though, though, is it? Because it doesn't fit in the song otherwise. So <laughs> you, can't, you can't mess around with that now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what about you, Jess? Anything strange about English we don't really notice day to day? Apostrophes in possessives. Apostrophes, like the word apostrophe means it's something has been turned away from a word, a letter has been sent away or omitted from a word. Um, and in contractions, like can't and hasn't and your, it's obvious what's missing, but possessives are also secretly missing a letter too when we use an apostrophe in a phrase like the queen's crown once the way to create possessives in middle english was to add an es to the end of the word so the apostrophe is signaling that missing e thanks to french influence (laughs) we love that um, so, like the yeah. in in Chaucer, you can like read the Middle English Canterbury Tales. Um, if you see the word knights, as in like the knights' armor, um, it's spelled K N Y G H T E S, and it's it's possessive. What a fantastic thing to throw back at people to get really annoyed about people mm-hmm. misusing apostrophes. To go right, no, you're right. Actually, <laughs> we should go back to the rules. Get rid of the apostrophe. <laughs> put an A in. Definitely. Do you have a favourite word origin story, Jess? Yeah. Oh, oh, I do. I do. Well, okay, I don't. I I have like a million of them. But uh, (laughs) 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 today's is electric. um, And the word electric means resembling amber. It has nothing to do with uh, energy, so to speak. Um, Like if you've ever seen Jurassic Park, you know, amber is the golden coloured fossilised resin uh, that preserves things. And Mm. in Latin, electricus, it was first um, cited in discussions of of um, magnetism. It was thought that amber was magnetic or could generate electricity because when you rub like wool or a cat's fur to it, it generates static electricity by friction very easily. So they thought it, it generated electricity and was magnetic. Uh, and then eventually wow. um, electricity was applied to like the, the generation of static electricity and then to lightning and then to modern electricity. Whoa. Oh, that's good. Oh, yeah, I like that. Yeah trouble with all these things is you say them and then it makes your brain go into it and then it's just a, it's not very good for the podcast because there's like a bit of a silence where everyone's processing the information Whoa. Going, wow. paul have you got a good tale about where a particular word comes from oh, see mine's not as cool as that mine's amethyst Ooh. oh but and, that's related uh, kind of yeah you, you're on the gems yeah. on the yeah the kind of the that, yeah that's true yeah yeah can you make jewelry from it yes we'll accept it as an answer <laughs> The thing with amethyst is that it literally means not drunk. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> because what? there was a. It, it comes from um, methus in, in Greek, which was uh, red wine. Um, and the A at the start is the same one, like in amoral and all the rest of it. It's, it's, an, it's an opposite form and kind of thing. And there was a theory in ancient Greece that if you drank wine or some kind of liquor from a vessel made of amethyst or that had an amethyst stone in it, that the stone would soak up the part that made you drunk so you could drink as much as possible and stay completely sober. <laughs> this sounds like promotional from Big Amethyst. <laughs> oh, I love and, this. Uh, yeah, so that was, the, the, that was the kind of theory behind it. Obviously, it's a pretty easy theory to test out. So even like Pliny the Elder, who wasn't particularly known for being scientifically <laughs> accurate, even he knew that it was complete bollocks um but yeah that it literally means not like not drunk on wine is amethyst wow. there's a there's a story that it was originally white and the reason that it's sort of purplish is because it soaks up the intoxicating part of red wine i yeah. love to think that all that came from just some kind of dell boy salesman <laughs> three thousand years ago that had this like job lot of amethyst cups on his hands and his wife you're never going to sell them now are you and they go hold on a minute i've got an idea <laughs> Wow, that is fascinating. <laughs> it is. It's also it's a theory worth testing. I might test that tonight. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. I can yeah. find myself some amethyst. Yeah. <laughs> test and report back. Uh, Jess, mm-hmm. do you have a favourite non-English word? And why would that be? I really love um, German compound words. And I actually oh, don't yes. know like yeah. how how widespread the actual usage of this word is or if it's something that like 
uh, English speakers cobbled together to be like, haha, look at this funny German compound. <laughs> but um, I'm going to try to say this right. Um, Backpfeifengesicht, I believe is how you say it. Um, and it means um, a, a face in need of a punch, a slappable face. <laughs> Backpfeifengesicht. Quite a useful word. <laughs> yeah, I think with, the great thing with a lot of German words is just their literal translation. They're yes. just so like, mm. there's no beating around the bush with them, is there? I remember in uh, doing GCSE German, and learning the word for diarrhea, which is durchbar. And the teacher just telling us, it literally just means fall through. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another one appropriate to this um, conversation is er Erklagensnut, which I believe means uh, explanation poverty. So like when you put us, us on the spot and we can't think of an answer, you're... Oh, wow, that's great. <laughs> explanation <laughs> poverty. I'm, I massacred that. Damn it, I feel like that should have been <laughs> the title to our podcast. We might need to change. <laughs> Paul, do you have a favourite foreign word? Um, mine is, it's Scots, which is technically a different language, but it's obviously very related to English. But there's a Scots word which I love, which is to tartle. Then tartling is like, it's that kind of moment of really awkward hesitation before you recognise someone. <laughs> so someone starts, <laughs> someone starts talking good. to you and you're like, yeah, I know who you are, but I don't really know who you are. And you start talking and you kind of have to hedge for a little while. That's tartling. I love that word. Wow, that. that's great. Right, Paul, we'll have you again. How about something people say but wrongly grammatical is? <laughs> <laughs> this is this is gonna go back to that you and me and this <laughs> that you and me thing. I, yeah, I because only because I'm guilty of that myself, using me at the start of a sentence. Yeah. I, but I, yeah, but you know, who wants to sound grammatical all the time? It's overrated. But if we're talking we were talking about it before, and I was gonna say at some point the 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 seesaw is going to tip on that one and that's going to become correct mm. yeah it'll end up in the dictionary yeah <laughs> jess you got anything common grammatical blunder i would say so one of my favorite things to write about it's more i guess a vocabulary blunder but uh, i love writing about acorns and malapropisms so like they're they're both mm. describe choosing a word that is close to the one you intended. Um, egg corns are a little more understandable, like champing at the bit versus chomping at the bit, uh, champing mm. being the original. Um, and then malapropisms are like more blatantly incorrect and they're named after the character Mrs. Malaprop from the uh, play The Rivals from um, I think it's a 1890s play. Um, and her, her name is made up of the French elements malapropo, literally poorly placed or badly for the purpose. So she mm -hmm. says things like um, derangement instead of arrangement and pineapple of politeness instead of pinnacle of politeness. And mm -hmm. it gives me hydrostatics to such a degree rather than hysterics. <laughs> um, and uh, one literary <laughs> critic d described her use of them as a... Uh, word fouling with a blunderbuss and i really enjoy that <laughs> i feel like some people do that you see it on the internet a lot but the magic yeah, yeah. i mean there's magic in it too like when someone I, i'm trying to think of an example there was one the other day where someone said like used the wrong word and it changed the meaning of the sentence and it was it was clearly a mistake but it it added meaning and ended up working well <laughs> someone said one recently to me uh they'd overcooked something on the barbecue and they said that's proper incarcerated. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like it. I like it. <laughs> okay, Paul, uh, what is, what's the most fascinating language you've come across? Um, it, it came out of writing uh, the book, I see. There's a language in New Mexico called Jemez, mm. which has just, it's, everything about it is extraordinary. Like it's vocabulary, it's grammar, it's morphology, like everything's amazing about it. In English, we make plurals by putting an S on the end of things, which is mm. kind of just standard. They have this uh, system called inverted number. So all the nouns in the language are either inherently singular or inherently plural. And you add something onto them if the number that you're talking about is kind of grammatically unexpected. So oh, right. okay. um, there's a, the word for uh, person is pa, and the word for people is pash. So you add an sh onto the end to make it plural. But the word for drums is po, and the word for drum is posh, because drums is inherently plural. So they've got this oh. kind of system of like, it's only if you're talking about a number of things that you don't normally have <laughs> that, you t that you tag <laughs> that you tag right. a plural ending onto the end of it. Um, it's a re it's a madcap system, and it just kind of blows my mind that it exists. That's so cool. <laughs> well, yeah. What about you, Jess? Most interesting language. Um, are you familiar with talk piscine? No. Mm -mm. Um, so you've probably heard of a pigeon language, right? 
Yeah. Mm. So pidgin is um, like a, a combined language, um, but a particular mm. kind. The word pidgin itself is a tumult of like Chinese and Portuguese and Malay words that are attempting to recreate the way Chinese people pronounce the English word business. So pidgin means business. And uh, so in the mid 1800s to the early 19th century, pidgin English meant business English. Of course, yeah. Suggesting course. the way Chinese people and other foreigners, especially people from Asian countries, spoke during business transactions at international trade ports. The language talk piscine is spoken in um, New Guinea. It is called New Guinea Pidgin, um, and it is officially a language in Papua New Guinea. Its name is also a pidgin term. Talk is an adaptation of the English word talk, like speaking, mm. and piscine is an adaptation of the word pidgin. So it's a double pidgin term that means talk business. <laughs> like the name of the language means talk business. It's amazing. <laughs> That is cool. I've always wanted to hear it spoken. <laughs> That's just reminded me of that. Um, I've mentioned it in the book that there's a brilliant pidgin language that mixed Icelandic with Basque. Oh, man. Um, whoa, whoa, which is about... Whoa, 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 whoa. what? How? <laughs> when? What? It, was, um, it was in the 1600s. Basque fishermen from Spain used to go whaling in the right. west coast of Iceland. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the two groups just did not get along. And what makes it really unusual is that we have three dictionaries that were written of, of this kind of contact language. It sounds like a great logline for a really unusual sitcom page. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. And so in these dictionaries, you'll kind of, there's like, it'll tell you the word for church, and then it'll tell you the word for cat, and it'll tell you the word for dolphin, and then it'll explain how to say, go fuck a horse. <laughs> <laughs> and then it'll tell you, you know, the word for seal, and then it'll be kiss my ass. Because they just wrote down everything that they needed oh. to know. <laughs> and it's obvious that like they had everything that was around them and they also really hated each other. So they've got this kind of bizarre pigeon language that's sort of like 50% insults. Wow. Brilliant. I feel like we've done this next question. I was going to ask you, Jess, uh, what's the most unusual word you can think of? I like animals a lot. And um, I found out the other day that there is a type of animal. Actually, I'm going to throw this back at you. It's a quiz. Mm -hmm. What type of animal is a tasseled wabagong? <laughs> is it one that you've just made up to mock us? <laughs> no, right, okay, just checking. I mean, a little bit. <laughs> Someone else made it up to mock me first. It sounds like a bird to me. It sounds like uh, a flightless bird. There you go. Say it again, Jess. Any other what guesses? Was it? Tasseled wabagon. Oh, a tasseled wabagon. Right. Um, is it um, <laughs> a medium sized rodent? It is a shark. It is a species of <laughs> yeah. carpet yeah. shark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Paul, have you got a particularly bizarre and interesting word that you'd like to share with the class? It's sort of, it's one of these words that you kind of wonder why it ever needed to exist, but a eucalagon is. Uh, a neighbor whose house is on fire. <laughs> Where's that come from? <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the uh, <laughs> it's one of the characters I think in the Aeneid in uh, a Greek literature is um, one of the elders of Troy whose house burns down, and then in the kind of fifteen sixteen hundreds, for some reason his name was kind of hauled out of the sort of two passages <laughs> in this book where he's mentioned and there's now his name's in the dictionary as the, a neighbor whose house is on fire i love the idea of using that to tease your neighbor after they've had a house fire <laughs> like for years later <laughs> hey look who it is that's brilliant brilliant right finally last one if we were to wave our magic linguistic wand which obsolete word or archaic would you like to be reinstated into uh, general usage tomorrow Paul. I mean, this is kind of like my bread and butter. So I've kind of made a career out of putting <laughs> yeah, these on yeah, Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I tell you one that I um, kind of stumbled across and immediately fell in love with, which is a, a, a palooza. And it sounds horrible, but a palooza has nothing to do with losing. It's an especially beautiful sunset is a palooza. Ooh. And I really like that. It's it's the fact that we've kind of needed a word for something that we just really like looking at. Nice. <laughs> so yeah, a palooza is a sunset. Do you know the trouble with that word? It doesn't sound like what it is, though. It doesn't. No, sound... it doesn't. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. It, apparently, it, it's um, the palooza is a um, 
A, a Jesse might know this, but it's a river in the northwest USA, the Palouse. Yeah, apparently. Um, I I believe it, it also appears in the names of several um like music festivals or like if you're gonna have a big party here, right? Like, you, your marketing will tack on the word like Joya Palooza or Fuda Palooza, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, apparently the river that that comes from has a specially nice sunset. <laughs> oh, so that's where this, this word comes from. Yeah, so, yeah. Nice. What about you, Jess? You've got an old word. Uh, mine would be balter. And this one, this one, I feel like we could reintroduce because it makes a lot of sense. It's uh, super joyful. It's a Middle English word. It means um, to dance gracelessly without particular art or skill, but perhaps with some <laughs> enjoyment. Um, and it shows up in like, uh, the death of Arthur and a variety of other things from like the 1200s <laughs> to the 1400s. Something. What was that again? What was the word again, Jess? Balter, B-A-L-T-E-R. Because I think I probably need to get that on a t-shirt because that is... Yeah. <laughs> um, that is me, yeah. I also, I love unpaired words and I feel like I, I people do do this already, but I, I like when people reintroduce the base words of unpaired yes. words, like the word disgruntled. Um, yeah. You know, I, I like the word gruntled yeah. and yeah. Uh, <laughs> things like that. Whelmed. Mm, exactly. Yeah. We had one last week in our Limerick special <laughs> episode. Um, Wambly. Oh, yeah, that's a lovely do either, word. Do Ooh. either of you know what that means or meant? I've heard wambledy cropped. And that's like having an upset stomach. That's exactly it, yeah. Oh, that's to great. To feel wambly. Right. So. Oh, I've got the wambles. <laughs> yeah, the wambles. <laughs> <laughs> that's reminded me of, uh, there's a great word, frobly morbly, which is like... <laughs> Paul's got so bored, he's just making stuff up now to yeah. see how far he can push <laughs> I know, it. yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, I, I'm secretly just, you know, dropping in like a ghost word here to see if it's a <laughs> dictionary. Um, no, frobly morbly was like Tudor English for like, if you're you're not well, but you're not unwell, so you can like you can get up and do what you need to do and go to work, but you're you're not great. You're then you're like frobly morbly. You're just kind of like you're in the middle somewhere. You can get on with your day, but you'd rather so, not. But then obviously that later on that was taken over by the term British, wasn't it? <laughs> Especially at the minute, yeah. Well, I thought you did extremely yeah, that was well there. Fascinating. Brilliant. Absolutely. I keep trying to not use the word fascinating since Jess said what it what its root was. But I can't Well, you know which word you need to use, Tommy. That was enthricing. Enthricing. It was. Mm. Do you know the word enthricing? Is, is this like some kind of odd compound of like enthrall? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Entice. Oh my God, they're good, aren't they? Aren't they good? <laughs> they're not good. <laughs> aren't they good? It's, Tom, it's Tommy's word. Tommy made it up. I made it up about 20 odd years ago and it's just not filtered into the language and I'm, I'm a bit upset about it, to be honest. We bring it up in practically every episode, and then, just hoping that someone, <laughs> it'll catch at some point. Every year, the Oxford Dictionary comes out with, oh, here are the new words we're going to include and it's like, bloody words about the internet or something and i'm like come on guys for once please but no nothing nothing so whatever maybe i need to work out what it's an acronym of ah yeah that, then it'll, yeah, yeah, then it'll yeah. link it to c yeah. some c activity c based activity <laughs> yeah make it nautical you'll be fine Never you'll it be right up. and then um yeah Tie it in with those Basque fishermen, mate. Eh? <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah. better nice. story. Yeah, yeah. You need a story. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Trouble is, you see, have, have this discussion. I just said Bob's your uncle. You have a discussion like this, and then things like that that would normally just mm. exist and move on. You start going, "Oh, where did Bob's your uncle come from?" Jess, are you familiar with that phrase? Is that I, I am familiar with the phrase, but it is not something that anyone in my life would say. Oh my god! Oh, it, <laughs> right. Firstly, it definitely needs introducing over that side of the pond, doesn't it? <laughs> It's very useful. Yeah, it's true. Do you know Tom? No, you're not. You're not just. No, no, I'm not. I'm not this them. isn't me leading up to going. Ah, oh, well, actually, word experts. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it is actually someone's uncle. I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure it was like a Victorian politician or something was like acted really nepotistically and got his nephew that, a job. That, that, I, yes, that I, would I, make sense. Sounds like I might be making this up, but I, I've got a feeling that there is a real person at the mm. core of this. I'll have written a blog about this and I've just forgotten about it. But ones like that, again, that's fascinating, like, <laughs> like Gordon Bennett and things like that that come into the language that obviously have a, a real root in a single mm. incident that then just stays with mm. us for years and years and years in the language. Fascinating. I've got one uh, it reminds me of, which is a really fascinating story. Uh, Sweet Fanny Adams, have you ever come across that phrase in the US, Jess? I have, um, but I can't remember what it means. Enlighten me. It's it's sort of a um, like a cover swear. It means not not very much or very little, mm. which can it can be shortened to sweet fa. 
which is obviously covering the real meaning, which is sweet fuck all. Right. But um, its origins are really interesting. They're quite grisly because Fanny Adams, I think she was a, a young girl from Hampshire, and she was murdered in a really particularly oh. brutal way. Um, Goodness. In the 1800s. But her name came to be used by, <laughs> funnily enough, <laughs> British seamen uh, a couple of years <laughs> later. Um, and these, these new rations, uh, like tins of mutton, were being introduced, which, you know, obviously weren't considered beautiful prime cuts of meat. And so it was suggested uh, rather unpleasantly that um, what was in the tin was the butchered remains of Fanny Adams. Oh, um, God. <laughs> <laughs> and that's yeah, and that's how it came to be known as Sweet Fanny Adams. Isn't that awful? But interesting. This is good. I, if um if my copy editor wouldn't kill me for adding more things to my book, I would add that. <laughs> it's already like twenty thousand words over though, so <laughs> Yeah. But apparently the the like the tins that this mutton came in, they would use them as cooking pots. And apparently large cooking pots are still known as fannies to this day. Hmm. Well, there you go. Are you just taking the piss and making this up now, John? <laughs> no, definitely not. I like how you immediately question him when we've given you like these preposterous definitions. Like we could have been making things up the whole time and you're like, oh, I accept this as fact. No, I think her, gra- her grave, I, there's a picture on the Wikipedia page of her grave in Alton wow. in Hampshire. So there you go. Very good. Very Top good. facts. Well, thank you, guys. Well, I think what we've, yeah, we've learned today that um, language is endlessly interesting. And if you do need to make up some etymology, just involve <laughs> sailors. <laughs> yeah. And people will believe you. Mm. Yes. Well, thank you for being our honorary failing writers for a very short spell. Uh, now you are, you are released and you can return to the land of the successful. Uh, <laughs> Right, well, thank you very much, guys. That really was fantastic. That was a lot of fun. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much. This has been lovely. Oh, I enjoyed that. Yeah, it is, uh, it is enjoyable. Weren't they lovely to hang they out were. with? They were, and after speaking to them, I bought um, Paul's book for my dad. Oh, yeah. Father's Day. Did you read it before you passed it no, on to No, no, I just got sent straight there, so... Um, you get to read it after. You can steal it back off him, can't you? Yeah. It's really good. It's yeah. really good. Highly recommend it. Um, but, yeah, that, really, that caressed my inner nerd mm. in ways which haven't been caressed for a little while. Hey, you know, we were talking about... We were talking about references to names and the origins of, mm, yeah, yeah. like, idioms containing names like Bob's Your Uncle and yes. uh, Gordon Bennett and stuff. Well, I've, I've done a little bit of research All right, me. okay. So, firstly, Paul was right about Bob's Your Uncle. It probably began, apparently, in 1887 when Conservative Prime Minister Robert Gascoigne Cecil, 3rd Marquess of Salisbury, a.k.a. Bob, yeah. appointed his nephew Arthur Balfour as Chief Secretary for Ireland. So it's just all nepotism. It was just a massively nepotistic move and apparently very unpopular at the time, which is how that um, sort of that idea of if you want something doing easily yeah. and immediately, you just need Bob as your uncle. But it's interesting now, it's like Bob's your uncle. Whereas then, then, when it first started, it must have been, oh yeah, Bob's your uncle. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, Bob's your uncle. But... Even more interestingly, I think, is the story of Gordon Bennett, which apparently begins with a man called James Gordon Bennett, who was a Scotsman, who moved to America in 1795 to get a job in the newspaper industry. Yeah. And by sort of 1835, he's only gone and founded the New York Herald. Gordon Bennett. Exactly. And so over the next several years, he builds it into basically the biggest circulation newspaper in the world. So as you can imagine, he's he's become quite a, a wealthy man. But his son, also called James Gordon Bennett, he wasn't quite the <laughs> he wasn't quite the entrepreneur his father was. It's the sort of uh it's the age old story of the, the heir to a fortune. Yeah. <laughs> uh becoming more of a playboy than uh, you know, a good businessman. Right. Yeah, not having to earn any, just spending it quite <laughs> Yeah, he's very good at spending yeah. it, exactly. So he's into he's into his cars, his planes, his women. He's a lot like me, Tom, basically. Yeah, for, it's, I, I was thinking there was a lot of uh, yeah. similarities ringing true then. <laughs> That's it. Um, so in, in 1866, he actually takes over the Herald 
and his new directive is not to instruct, but to startle. So that was the whole kind of raison d'etre of the newspaper. And his life was in some ways more sensational than the stories he was encouraging because he was constantly spending his inheritance on like motor races and um, hot air balloon races. Wow. Apparently there's a, there's a Gordon Bennett Cup, which is still held today, apparently. And, um, and he funded expeditions like uh, Stanley's trip to Africa to find missing explorer Livingston. Yeah. He was the guy who sort of put the money up for that. But the thing he was most famous for, <laughs> probably in that cruel way that, um, you know, despite all these big gestures, all the sports events and everything that he funded, he was most famous for entering the Guinness Book of Records for the greatest engagement faux pas ever after getting completely smashed and then pissing into the fireplace of his fiance's parents' house on the night he got engaged. That's not traditional, is it? <laughs> no, that isn't. No. Not specifically, no. So you can sort of see why some people started to say Gordon Bennett As when they were alarmed by something. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Good research, John. Good research. Well, thanks very much. But it also, just interestingly, because we were talking about like fake swears um, in, you know, in relation to um, Sweet F.A., but that was that also sort of became a fake swear in the sense that, or uh, what do they call them, minced oaths, because it's quite close to gore blimey, right. apparently. So Gordon Bennett, it was a little bit close to gore blimey, which in itself is a minced oath of God blind me. Yeah. So it sort of became like a watered down version of that. But it was also very handy that it was this guy who, uh, you know, was perfect uh, storm. Uh, did, yeah. 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 Did alarming things. Okay. So it became a nice little joke, a little play on an exclamation of surprise. So there you go. Mm, yeah, very interesting. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, that's, uh, that's enough nerdiness now, probably, isn't it? Probably, uh, that probably is enough, isn't it? Have you got you got any more? Uh, well, I haven't got anything mm. uh, pertaining to uh, nerdy wordplay, but I did have something else to say. Mm. Do you remember last episode, um, we did our children's stories? Oh, yeah. And um, I promised that I would uh, play my reading of my story to my daughter. Oh, yeah. Uh, and the worst possible thing happened, John. So, <laughs> what was that? What, can you imagine? What, what do you think is the worst possible thing? Okay, so the worst possible thing that could happen to you is your daughter said, uh, so where's the rest of the story, Dad? Yep. <laughs> I love that. Where's the rest of it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, you can't, <laughs> we're going to finish it for me. <laughs> well, that's brilliant. Ouch. How brilliant Ouch. is that? What a great review. Yeah, well, there is that. I mean, yeah. <laughs> But she could have just said, that's rubbish, I don't like it. Yeah, that would have been easier. Yeah, done. <laughs> so there. Well, think about how quickly you, you knock that off, Tom. Well, that's true, yeah. Come yeah, on. Yeah. So how long is it going to take? How many words was it out of interest? Uh, oh, it was about 3,000 words. Okay, and how many do you, do you think are left? Well, it's about 10%, isn't it, in the book? Probably, probably is, yeah. Know, for these kids' ones. Well, there you go. Yeah. So you should have that done. In so that it's not, well, what I took about. Two or three hours, I think, to do, didn't it? Oh, right, so, so give it a couple of weeks. Well, not even that, really, if you you'll just be, do it all in one go. well over, yeah. Do it in a day, really, technically. <laughs> yeah, do it, Tom. Yeah, well, probably should. You've got a, you've got a reason now. <laughs> yeah, got a, yeah, yeah. This is the problem with coming up with new ideas, isn't it? Yeah. You never get the old one finished <laughs> That's off. been my eternal problem, isn't it? You're always moving on to the next That's one. why we started this podcast three years ago or whatever, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. I feel like we're closing in on some stuff. <laughs> do you? Good for you. <laughs> Very slowly Good creeping view. towards the end of some stuff. Yeah. Oh, and uh, and what? Something else I have that links, mm. kind of links to the nerdy word thing. And I was going to link on to our uh, whip things. Okay. And it was something that came up in conversation uh, with uh, a listener mm -hmm. that you will know as well, uh, a certain Steve Henderson. Oh yeah. And he was saying, so uh, you remember your fantastic. <laughs> pick any of the accents scottish accent american accent <laughs> um yes but in particular yeah. the scottish and the american are very important for this oh yeah so if you say i know what you're gonna say i love this if you say space ghettos yeah in an east coast american accent <laughs> it is also the perfect way of saying spice girls <laughs> in a very deep glaswegian accent do it tom space ghettos <laughs> It's it amazing. Work. It does actually work. Space ghetto. <laughs> ah, 
<laughs> yeah, so there you go. That uh, it just it, well, that that nice. very much bridges the gap between nerdy wordplay and us doing our whip analysis. It does. It does. Have we got a, we got a name for it? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. We have completely run out of names. I had one the other. I thought of one. Was it? It wasn't that good. Danger whip tide. That was it. There you go. Mm. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Tom. Mm. <laughs> you just got whiplashed. Right, whiplash. Whiplash. Call it whiplash this week. It's better. Actually, we could call this week's whiplash because it did have a little bit of a a twist, didn't it? Like a a sea change moment in the story quite early on that sort yes. of took you by surprise. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. Well, should we definitely. let people have a little listen to some of it and then we'll uh, yeah, let's we'll do have that. a chat about. Oh, hang on. Before we listen, mm. Tom. Um, if you were rating the appropriateness, Tom, what certificate would you give this? The following whip has an age rating of 15. That's perfect, yeah. That's, that's bang on. If you're listening in the car with children, you might want to listen to this later in the yeah. privacy of your boudoir. I love the idea you have this beautifully naive idea that people sit and listen with their children to our <laughs> output. <laughs> if kids will be interested in any way. Is that not how it works? Do people not sit think... around the fire with their kids? <laughs> yeah, of course it is, mate. A child oh, on each yeah. knee. Of course it is. Of course it is. <laughs> Horses. Mummy, mummy, can we listen to the Failing Water Boys again tonight, please? <laughs> no, I, I used to do that a lot. I used to be driving along in the car and the, when the kids were quite little and I'd be listening to podcasts and things. And because I think they were, you know, they would sort of, they'd be like science based. And then some twat would come on and start swearing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Just so I'm see. just. I'm just pointing it out. I mean, people are probably aware that we do. Uh, we, we will drop a clangor occasionally, but I just wanted to. Yeah, make it. No, clear. it's. I mean, it's. It's. Uh, <laughs> it's full of sex and violence, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. There you go. Really. So. So let's hear that. I'm dying to hear that now. Yeah. So this. Yes. Before we hear it, we should also say who it's by. Yeah. Um. It is by Haley Price, and it is a story called The Vermilion Ribbon, which is her first novel. Um, and apparently, I think it's out in like a month's time or something. And it is the first book of a series, The Vermilion Saga. So um, let's dive in. The Vermilion Ribbon by Haley Price. Chapter One The Meal Prepared. Like all young girls of Dur, Corel dreamed of love. In her dreams, she would arrive at a ball in a luxurious carriage drawn by four spirited white horses. She would step daintily from the carriage as though she floated on the very air itself, arrayed in a spectacular gown that had been fashioned for her by her father in his garment shop. The assembled revelers would gasp and swoon with envy as her lover descended from the carriage and swept her onto the dance floor. They would dance all night before they returned to their home and made love until the sunrise. Unlike most young girls of Dur, the voice that moaned in the hot, passionate nights of her dreams belonged to a woman. Her lover would invariably be tall and exquisitely beautiful, with a voluptuous figure and long blonde hair that spilled around Corel's face like sunlight as they lay together in the sumptuous bed in their enormous house. As her teen years began, the dreams became nightmares. I love you. Her lover would whisper, and blood would pump from a gash that appeared across her throat. As Corel opened her mouth to scream, her lover's blood poured into it and congealed. No sound could escape through the dense blood, and Corel would wake wet with sweat and tears. Those three words had betrayed her and killed the woman she adored. She must never love, she told herself. She could not allow love to rob her of the woman of her dreams. Corel had no friends and had always been socially awkward. She'd worked in her father's shop since her earliest years, learned quickly and became highly skilled at making, the work with needle thread and scissors that created the garments that the wealthy citizens of Ryle desired. Corel's most notable talent, however, lay in the design of elaborate dresses for the wealthy women of the city. Ryle had the smallest population of the five cities, but it boasted more than its fair share of wealthy residents, and those fortunate enough to possess vast quantities of coin were more than content to spend large sums of it on appearances. Corel's design soon became the talk of the city, and her father's shop attracted large numbers of clients with both wealth and taste. Midway through her teen years, 
The Portreeve himself visited Carell's father's shop. In any town or city, the Portreeve, personally appointed by the Duke's bailiff, symbolised success. Rich and powerful, he controlled the commercial and legal heart of the city. Carell's father told her there could be no greater honour for his shop. But Carell had no interest in the Portreeve. Men in Dour did not wear dresses, and Carell only cared to make dresses. Whenever she created waistcoats or elaborate tunics for men, she did so reluctantly and with none of the artistry that could be found in her dresses. The Portreeve brought his wife with him, and she wished to try on a particularly intricate dress that Carell had completed two days before. While Carell's father and the Portreeve went into the office at the rear of the shop, Carell and her mother busied themselves with the Portreeve's wife and the dress. The dress required very little adjustment to fit since her height and figure resembled Carell's, and Carell had crafted the dress in her own size. The Portreeve's wife gazed at herself in the reflecting glass. The spectacular dress had highly detailed lacework on the bodice and a modest hoop skirt that stopped short of her ankles. Despite Carell's concern that the Portreeve's wife might think the length of the dress improper, the woman clearly adored it. Oh, such a marvellous dress! She cooed to Carell's mother as she spun before the glass and jealously drank in the woman reflected back at her. The making is wonderful! You are extraordinarily talented, truly! My thanks, Carell's mother replied. I did not make the dress, however. It is my daughter Carell's making, in truth. The Portree's wife wore a look of disbelief as she turned to Carell. Can it be? she asked. You are barely in your teen years, surely. To possess such skill so young is remarkable. Carell felt her cheeks turn red, the heat of embarrassment in them. She found herself uncomfortable with the compliment, although she could not understand why. My thanks, she whispered, eyes downcast. I simply must have it, the Portreeve's wife went on. Have it delivered to my residence as soon as may be arranged. I shall wear it to the next Portreeve's ball, and your little shop will be the talk of Ryle. Carell's mother gushed over the Portreeve's wife's appearance in the dress and thanked her for her business. Carell noticed that no payment for the dress had been offered, nor had the woman so much as said please or my thanks. Her resentment at the fact that the Portreeve's wife had spoken of their shop with such condescension gnawed at her. Little shop, she growled in her mind. Not so little that you do not recognise the finest making in the city. She bit down on her disappointment that the woman had helped herself to the dress and swept away insistent visions of the Portreeve's wife as one of the covetous attendees who fawned at the feet of Carell and her tall blonde lover at the ball in her dreams. At dinner that night, she grumbled that the dress had been requisitioned rather than purchased. Her father appeared shocked at her churlish reaction. He felt certain that the Portreeve's wife would drive new business to the shop once she wore the dress among the most powerful and influential people in the city. Why did they even come here? Carell asked. Bitterness threatened to become anger. He invited me to contribute to the levies, her father replied. He looked like a cat that had been thrown a delectable fish. Nothing about the levies or the politics of Dor interested her. And try as she might, she could not quash her resentment about the woman's self-important attitude in the shop. She stifled a bored yawn. Oh, I do not care for these things. Why should I care if Ryle is a city or a village? I do not. And I do not care about the stupid levies. You must learn to care, her mother replied. One day you must take over the shop when we're too old. Carell spat out derisive laughter at the outrageous concept that a woman might be permitted to own a business in Dour. Her father attempted to persuade her that women could run shops or other businesses as successfully as a man, but she remained sceptical. She knew only one woman who did, Saboti, the old woman who owned a general shop across the road. There is no certainty that some handsome fellow will whisk you off and keep you in grand style, her father told her. Good, she shot back as the face of the woman from her dreams swam into her mind. I do not desire such a thing and never will. Her mother smiled sadly at her, and her father stared at her open-mouthed. Corral had gone too far. Dreams such as hers found no acceptance in Dur, and few people would dare to mention them. She and her lover only danced in her dreams, and Corral did not believe that she would ever enjoy such pleasures in her life. Anger had prompted her admission and she changed the subject. And 
What is the purpose of these levies? She asked. The Portreeve uses the funds to maintain the city. Any balances are remitted to the Duke's bailiff. Those balances serve to retain the city charter. What pompous nonsense! Corel responded, contemptuous of her father's fascination with such a dull subject. I am content to design and create my gowns. I shall leave such high affairs up to you, father, she said, and she excused herself from the table. Corel lay on her bed and cursed the fate that had been written for her. Bad enough to be born a woman in Dora, but to be born a woman who wished for the intimate company of other women assured her of a life of dissatisfaction and frustration. She would be unlikely to ever meet another woman who felt as she did. She must bury her desires deep within herself, where society could not see them for the remainder of her days. She cried at the unfairness of her fate. Before she fell asleep, she recalled a girl who sometimes came to the shop with her mother and whom Corel had felt some attraction toward, although the girl had never shown any interest in her. When she closed her eyes tonight, she saw the girl again and her hand drifted between her legs. Before she reached satisfaction, the girl had been replaced by the woman of her dreams. When Corel's moon cycle began, her mother took her to a local shop. A woman owned the shop, or girl, and she sold a sweet, heady drink that helped relieve the cramps. Why must women be so cursed? Corel wondered as she reflected on the injustice of the moon cycle. Every 26 days, 11 times a year, it came on her, and she could not guess why she deserved such an unfair life or why it became more unfavourable at every turn. Corel enjoyed the taste of the drink, however, and she visited the shop frequently thereafter, even outside her moon cycle. Corel's father had been correct about the impact of their business on their newfound popularity with the Portreeve and his wife's wealthy friends. One cold grey day, when Corel was 17 years, she decided to visit Orgel's shop and take a cup of the drink as relief from a complex design she worked on as a commission from a friend of the Portreeve's wife. The unnecessarily complex making irritated her, and she uncharacteristically struggled to remain focused on the work. She pushed the door of the shop open and came to an abrupt halt, open-mouthed. A tall, blonde woman, who sat alone at one of the tables, turned and stared with bright blue eyes that pierced Corel and brought a flutter to her heart. Long blonde hair hung in curls beyond her shoulders. Corel had never seen a more beautiful woman. The woman from her dreams. So closely did the woman resemble the lover from her dreams that Corel steadied herself on the doorframe as lightheadedness threatened to overcome her. As they stared at one another, Corel longed to dive recklessly into the deep pools of those blue eyes, never to surface again. Corel ordered a cup of the drink and casually gazed around the shop at the six other women there. They had all looked up when she had entered, but their interest had returned to their own conversations. The lone blonde woman still watched Corel and the way in which those blue eyes drank in Corel's body tantalized her. Corel's stomach tensed as a need sprang to life inside her, far beyond anything she had felt for the girl she had been attracted to at her father's shop. Orgel handed her the drink, and Corel left a groat on the counter and headed to the woman's table. May I join you? she asked. Please. The woman responded as she pointed at the vacant chair opposite her, her eyes fixed on Corel's own. Corel instead chose to sit on a chair to the woman's left. My name is Corel, she said. The brazenness of her actions excited her, and between her legs her sex tingled in a way she had not experienced before. Arella. The other replied with a smile. Arella looked older than Corel, although the citizens of Dor did not celebrate their birthday and reckoned their ages only roughly. She had full, moist lips and flawless skin and her eyes captivated Corel and took her breath away. Corel's body shook with an excitement that she could not find words to describe, and as she gazed into Arella's eyes, she felt certain that she saw there an invitation to a journey she had never taken, but now longed for with every beat of her heart. They sipped their drinks in silence for a few moments, until, as her heart raced so fast that she feared it might burst, Corel found the courage to ask her, do you have rooms nearby? Her voice trembled as she spoke, but whether from fear or desire, she could not have said. That I do, Arella responded. 
she had a clear, gentle voice, like a soft cloth that wiped a fevered brow. Corel laid a hand on Arella's arm and stared pointedly into her eyes. I greatly desire to see them. She breathed. The shameless invitation appeared to take Arella by surprise, and she glanced around until she seemed satisfied that none of the other women took any notice of them. That might seem inappropriate to many, she whispered. That it might, although not to me, Corel responded, and she squeezed the arm that her hand rested on. Nor to you, I hope. Arella did not reply immediately. She appeared to consider the proposition, but her eyes betrayed her. They were full of desire, and Corel knew that she had not missed her guess. At last, Arella stood and leaned forward, her response spoken softly so that only Corel might hear. Please join me at my lodgings. I am certain that there are things we might discuss there that would be pleasurable to us both. I think it's fair to say that this, that we are not the market for this book. Do you know what I mean? I think we can <laughs> no, take that as right. It's tricky, <laughs> isn't it? It's just tricky. But I think when the assassin mm. thing was introduced, it did prick my ears. I kind of, oh, hold on a mm. minute. Here we go. And uh, I thought that was really good. Yeah. yeah. I thought that was really good. We, I feel like we sort of, we should probably say to the listeners, we kind of cut the story there just before it gets really quite interesting. Um I found a little bit of blurb, actually, about the rest of the book. Shall I, shall I say? Because the first bit doesn't really... We don't really Ooh, get yeah, to any on. of that, do we? Haley says, Corel is drawn into a clandestine group of killers. Betrayed, she slays her own lover to flee. She finds new love, but her past creates problems. New deaths expose them to new risks. Can they escape with their lives and love intact? The Vermilion Ribbon is recommended to 18-plus readers only. There you go. It's actually an 18. Oh, 18, yeah. 18. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. But it probably gets worse. It starts 15, isn't it? Yeah, definitely, definitely 15 for the other. I did think that was actually a really brave uh, writing move to kill off one of the main characters mm, so early. Yeah. It did make me kind of, you know, when you have that little start of like, oh, my God. Yeah. You, were, I was, you were always thinking, oh, yeah, they're going to work around this somehow so that doesn't have to happen. <laughs> yeah. But I thought it was actually a really bold, yeah, brave thing. it is. It, and it kicks it kicks the whole story off quite well, doesn't it? Because it's like, what the hell? To my inexperienced eye, um, it reads like the kind of thing you might expect to find in like the the bedside drawer of a holiday apartment. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's left over from the last guest who clearly thoroughly enjoyed it, but doesn't necessarily want to admit it <laughs> yeah, by putting yeah. it on their bookshelf yeah. back home. But you know we'll I mean? just burn through it. You can just pick it up and oh, read. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You just keep... Destroy it yeah, yeah. and be utterly like yeah. gripped by it, not even look up from it. Yeah, I yeah, it's, I, I enjoyed the language of it. I thought it was really, it was nice, kind of simple, unpretentious language, wasn't it? But it had yeah. those few like uh, sort of quirky, archaic um, expressions yeah. sort of scattered around. And it made, do you know what it made me think? It made me think of like, um, almost like a sort of Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale until he obviously got to the sexy bits. <laughs> yeah. But um, there were fra- that was phrases more like, like Hans Christian Andersen. Uh, Han, Hans, no. Hans. <clears throat> yeah. But yeah, little bits like mayhap he thought that her words had been a jest and stuff like that. You know, it's like. Uh, it really kept you in the world, that though, didn't it? I thought. Yeah, it was nice. It kind of, kind of really put a bit of a sepia tone on the whole thing and kept you in that world and universe and era and style yeah it's got a sort of because it seemed very innocent to begin with didn't it it's sort of got cinderella vibes which i think makes for quite an interesting spin because then i think the the sort of more erotic moments feel more taboo does that make sense because it's sort of it it almost shouldn't be like that because this is like fairy tale land um but that almost almost makes it more erotic to me because yeah but I think, um, for me, it, it maybe took a little bit too long to get going uh, as a story. I don't know what you felt about There's that. a decent chunk of exposition, isn't there? But, I, yeah, I didn't really mind. I felt like he, it set it all but up. I th- maybe I thought once I'd got past it and I was enjoying the actual moving story of it, I kind of maybe mm. felt then that I was like, oh, this should be up front and centre because I think that's what will keep people reading it. Yeah. I think you could maybe you could lose a few readers early on and they think, oh, God, you've missed, you don't understand what's about to happen here. Mm. But maybe that's the reward you get for sticking with it. I think so. But, and you, know, you get to the books shouldn't just be a, a straight in and yeah, yeah. 
I know what you mean, but you sort you sort of need that as well, don't you? You need to yeah. you need to care yeah. a bit about her, and then I'm all I'm all for getting into the story very quickly. But I do think in the case of this, it sets up this sort of slightly fairy taleish world, and then it flips it on its head, doesn't it? Yeah. it's very dark. And... Maybe, maybe I felt there was too much exposition altogether, and maybe it needed mm. splitting up or spreading out a bit. Maybe yeah. you felt like you kind of trawled through quite a lot of it to get where you're going which i get do you mean you should have that to some extent because you need a reward and you need to yeah. build things up but no i did enjoy it um i liked the uh i liked the darkness of it but i know i know what you're saying um it's it's always a case of getting to the point but yeah i think because after that was just there was really good story weaving in there wasn't there yeah a kind of running yeah, these yeah. parallel little stories and jumping back to that and, and showing how this happened yeah and the dilemmas yeah yeah facing the characters yeah it's a proper always like good it turns into sort of a, an adventure doesn't it like you kind of really on a yeah it puts Corell into this kind of conveyor belt the only way now is forward yeah which kind of made the mistakes that now meant there's no going back yeah that's i it. thought that was that was a good you know when we've done the things about um Save the cat and kind of the uh, frameworks of stories and stuff. There is that, yeah, the beats. Yeah, and there's that kind of she turning point, shoved, point of no return. Yeah, she's shoved off a cliff, isn't she? Yeah, basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I, that's something actually. I I thought maybe when she joins the guild, it all just seems a bit mm. soft and easy for her. I I don't know if I would have wanted her maybe to have been struggled a bit more, tricked or forced in. You know, I had mm. like had less choice than she's had to. Do it. it just felt a bit of a an easy choice for such a tough thing. Mm. But then I see. I think that I thought this after I'd started then, doing these notes. It was kind of like, oh my god, I'm really buying into. Do you mean it's like, <laughs> yeah, well, exactly, really buying yeah. into this. I'm thinking, well, and it's entirely what's what's kind of good about it is it's completely against every mor- moral value that she holds. But she's doing it for love, isn't she? Yeah. Which only makes what happens afterwards even more like horrifying. Yeah, I guess I would have liked, yes, yeah, yeah. maybe a bit more torn about it. You know, like kind of really struggling with it, and mm, yeah, 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 and just yeah. yeah but I think that's really partly conflicted. that is me. I know what you mean. Buying into it and enjoying mm. it a lot more than I thought I would. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? When you read something that you have no um, sort of prior experience of, it's really interesting because you you've no concept of what the tropes are. Really, mm, mm. you kind of got a you kind of got a rough idea of the sort of things that might happen. And we've read enough stories, but at the same time, it feels like the this kind of thing has its own rules that I'm not necessarily familiar with. Right, okay, yeah. But um, I don't know. But yeah, well done, Hayley. Yeah, great story. Very intriguing. And you've written a bloody book. Yeah. And it's about to be released. That's fantastic, that. It is. doesn't get any better yeah. than that. Well, it does get better. It gets better if people actually go out and buy it as well. A massive international bestseller. That's yeah, better, that is it? better. Yeah, hopefully it will. <laughs> well, I have a feeling there's quite there's, there's probably quite a big market for this kind of thing. Yeah, this is what we should be writing, Tom. Yeah, but um, yeah, well done, Haley. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Good work. We will put details in the show notes. Check it out if you want to find out what happens next. I reckon you do. So, Tom. Yes, John. Um. I'd quite like to talk about next episode. You must. You must. I, I want to, so I'm going to. We have young adult fiction royalty on the show. We are talking to the actual Patrick Ness. He of A Monster Calls fame, Chaos Walking Trilogy, and uh, and some of my favourite writing for teenagers, actually. So um, so don't miss that. Uh, have we got anything else to say, Tommy? I th- but no. I don't think I have. (laughs) At all? Or? Nothing. No, no, he's finished. There you go. Tom's run out of words. Done. My lord. Hello. Where's everybody gone?